three faces of protest with correspondent Ralph Begleiter. April 6, 1972, President Nixon sent massed formations of B-52 bombers and Phantom jet fighters back over North Vietnam. These missions may have appeased military strategists, but the reaction here at Columbia was predictable. Outrage, indignation, protest. United States escalation had already brought campus disruptions twice before, in 1968 and 1970. Though the two-year cycle may be more coincidental than portentous, the individual strikes can be seen as parts of a single historical event. At Columbia in 1972, three faces, three faces of protest and their personalities illuminated the similarities and differences between the strikes. At the strike's apogee, five halls were occupied by protesters although classes held in most of them were merely transferred to other sites. This year's strike, like the one in 1968, saw police on campus. Another opposing faction also appeared again, more militant than 68. Majority Coalition, a group of students and faculty willing to use force to keep university buildings open. Earlier strikes had a strong leadership. This spring, direction came sporadically and rarely. There were no media stars like Mark Rudd, only those who took the lead hesitantly and dropped it quickly. Student Senator Jarvis Kellogg, a free spirit, was content to drift and unwilling to take the responsibility of leadership. Others, like 30-year-old Rod Wallace, were interested in narrowly defined objectives like the expulsion of university scientists who participate in war research. There are those like senior Rick Hamlin working against a government they feel is struck on a course of genocide in Southeast Asia. And I think that there has to be leadership at the real leadership comes out of the people and is always in constant touch with the people and what has happened a lot of times in in student struggles is that the leadership became separated from the people and ceased to understand where people were at <clears throat> so that I see the need to like develop a more coherent leadership a more coherent expression of people's feelings and people's needs and what people want done. But I think that this has to come from the people. It can't be uh, from the top down. Hamlin, 22-year-old religion major, self-proclaimed anti-imperialist, former member of Students for a Democratic Society, at odds with powerful moneyed interests. The corporations, the banks, the relationship between industry and the military, um, and that the people, the political parties, are pretty much run by the people who contribute money, which are these same moneyed interests, and that they have a definite worldview and outlook, which is fundamentally different from mine. They, um, first and foremost, view profit as, as the essential thing, and I view human relations and the benefit of human beings as to be more important than any form of property or money. Hamlin holds no student government office, but students who know him say he could have been a leader if it weren't for his own reservations. Hamlin participated in, and at times organized, coercive picketing in front of several university buildings. He was in front of Hamilton when police arrived. He picketed the library of the East Asian Institute in Kent Hall. And there was a confrontation at Philosophy Hall. We're physically uh, blocking our it bodies are our here. bodies are in the way, but right. we're not violently we're not, pushing them, we're just holding them We're not going to pound on anybody. So the way that you have to Supposing I'm a philosopher and I decide that I want to beat on here. us, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, so you can't get in the door. This is the Reverend Father Marshall, and he uh -huh. has a right no one to has get in here. To get in. The and building the is closed. Come prior. You're a reverend? Right. You're a reverend? <laughs> That's right. Are you a Do violent you believe, reverend, sir? Do you believe in pacifism? No, not if it means education. Well, at least you're not chauvinistic <laughs> enough to not beat on a girl. Right? What? Would you like to throw me down Once again, steps? the church is being imperialistic and trying to force its way yeah. in. Well, what's wrong with a 
uh, educational institution that was started by religion. Huh? Uh, yeah. Right? Uh, you, you may be interested, sir, there was a priest over at, uh, any problems down there who, also, who also tried forcibly to get in, but he did not ask for special privileges as a clergyman. He made a point of saying that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just, incidentally, the man who attempted to enter the building later told us he was not a clergyman. While Hamlin is aware that civil disobedience may actually hurt the anti-war movement in some cases, in others he calls it educational. The rules are primarily that, that it, the actions taken should be something that, first of all, does not hurt people who, um, who are the people, people who are not in decision-making position. That these actions should also t take place in the context of, of providing the greatest political understanding possible at that moment that sometimes uh, an act that an individual might do, like throwing a rock, would endanger other people unnecessarily, would, would be a provocative action, and, and that's the kind of action that I, dis that I refrain from myself and, and discourage other people from doing. But while angry crowds threw rocks and broke windows at the School of International Affairs, SIA, others simply turned away or even took the other side, demanding an end to the strike. Mike Marion was one of the organizers of Majority Coalition. My roommates and I are the ones that started Majority Coalition, and there were uh, three or four people who, who immediately helped us out and have been working very hard. Uh, of necessity, we've had to make a lot of spontaneous decisions, but the major decisions have been made by people that have come to the meetings. I would say that there are probably 25 or 30 people that uh, work constantly. Uh, now we had we had we started out with 20 people on Lou Plaza going over to mathematics, and we picked up at least an additional 20 to go in. Is that how many took mathematics? Approximately 40, I would say. I uh, 25 to 40. I, I'm not certain. I'm sure that it's within that range. Was it a violent confrontation there? No. Uh, we went through the building. We uh, open up the door, knock down barricades, uh, snipped open the chains on the front door, open up the door, and that was it. Relatively easy then? Uh, yes, I th it was relatively easy. Uh, we, we, didn't want, we didn't want any confrontations with anybody, and we were, we were quite pleased that it went as smoothly as it did and as nonviolently as it did. I think a lot of people in that organization are, are out and out fascists, that they support the bombing, that they support business as usual there and also they take action against people they took on a number of occasions direct action against people that were acting against the war hamlin argues that for him the decision to act was a moral one the realization that we're at a crisis in in the world in history at this point in time that the realization that the war has for a long time not just been simply a war against the military forces of, of the Vietnamese people, but against the entire people, against the entire culture, against the, ent the countryside itself, the destruction of the countryside itself, so that those things motivated me to come out. I felt that I could not be silent while these things were happening. I could not stand by and, and let other people do things that I had to take uh, an active role. The administration has started disciplinary action against Hamlin and some 50 others who participated in coercive picketing. I think it's very interesting that McGill isn't on trial for bringing the police on campus over the wishes of the police commissioner, the mayor of the city, uh, causing harm to students. I think it's interesting that faculty members that assaulted students aren't on trial, that faculty members that were on the picket lines aren't on trial. It's saying to people that if you, if you take action, that the university will take measures against you, that what the university approves of is silence. Although Hamlin feels campus protest has influenced international and national affairs, He's not sure that success has boosted morale among anti-war activists. I think it is generally true, though, that there is 
tr tremendous feelings of powerlessness, cynicism, apathy on the part of large numbers of people, and that. But this is this is true. I mean, this is true throughout the country, and this is one of the things that's being struggled with because the the war and the struggle against the war has moved to a new phase. Hamlin's new phase has been going on now for more than four years. The latest resurgence began last April 17th. Five days later, protesters announced their intention to close down the university. So I say, on strike, shut it down. that under no conditions would he accept either a short moratorium or a long strike. But by April 26th, strikers had occupied mathematics, Hamilton, okay, Kent, Pupine, and Lewis and Halls, not without administration resistance, in this case from undergraduate dean Carl Hovde. University Senate meeting convened in Uris Hall, President McGill made his first attempt to break the strike with police assistance. In that instance, he ordered police to remove coercive picketers from SIA. Five days later, President McGill brought police onto the main campus itself. Like Meanwhile, Pupine Hall was under control of a group of faculty members from several city universities. The Pupine occupation organized by SESPA, scientists and engineers for social and political action, was an independent protest. President McGill called the occupation by outside faculty members a rape. Pupine was among the better organized of the occupations, and it remained so to the final arrest on April 28th of three of the group's members. One of those arrested was PhD candidate in physics, Rod Wallace. Wallace, 30 years old, married with a son named after Robert Kennedy, expects to receive his doctorate in January 1974. Wallace's radical politics has irked many on the faculty. 
One professor on the Orals Committee, which reviews student progress, even advocates that Wallace be failed for his participation in the strike. Echoing the philosophy of Albert Camus, Wallace's attitude towards the war is a projection of his feelings about society. Living in America is like living in a country suffering under a plague. Some people get the plague and some people don't. And some people survive it. And I'd say I'm just one of those who survived the plague. As a CESPA leader, Wallace wants to prevent Columbia scientists from participating in war research. Jason is a group of 35 university scientists throughout the nation who work six weeks during the summer as part of the Institute of Defense Analysis. There are five Jason members who are on Columbia's physics faculty based in Pupine Hall. One member, Henry Foley, is department chairman. Four demands sent to President McGill by the strikers this spring was that professors either sever their Jason affiliations or leave the university. A, a university community is essentially an intellectual courthouse. And there are only so many things a House of Prostitution can do in, in protest over, over some outrage. And un universities have no political muscle, they have no economic power. But the only instrument of protest they have is to shut down. Although Wallace claims the strike was effective, none of the professors have resigned from either Columbia or from Jason. He agrees with Hamlin, regretting that more students were not interested in working against the war. Society's criminals, he says, include those who remain silent in the face of injustice. His attitudes parallel those of Eldridge Cleaver. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. In terms of the Vietnam War, 76 percent of the people express verbal opposition to the war. But when it comes to concrete actions, most Americans actively support the war. Uh, because most Americans don't want this country beaten by people they consider, uh, consider to be a bunch of slanty-eyed little bastards. I think the same is true on Colombia. Although many people at Colombia verbally oppose the war, when it comes to an action, they will act in such a way as to prolong the war. I don't think that um, there's any correlation between academic institution and, uh, and the war in Vietnam. Um, if I want to go to class, I'll go to class. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do about my feelings about the war. Well, I don't um, think this particular um, get-together on campus is maybe symbolic as it should be, although it is the first time since Kent State that we've seen any school get up and react to the war again. Um, it's, it's about time. Nixon waited his two years out, and now but he's back. you class, right? Yeah, I am. How do you justify that? Um, I'm not sure that I do. I just that I don't. I don't feel this particular show is going to be symbolic of anything. I I can't be sympathetic. It, it looks too much like fun. But there were those, like this graduate student, who opposed Wallace's stand on Jason. John, what do you know about Jason? Maybe you should talk to people about Jason. You really want to know? Yes. All right. Uh, Jason is about 35 or 40 academic science. Yeah. The work as volunteers at the Pentagon. Right. They work primarily on two projects, national defense by nuclear genocide and counterinsurgency in Vietnam. You're forgetting disarmament, Rod. No, they don't work on disarmament. Oh, yes, they do. The very first... Yes. The very first... The very first... The very first... Look. And all the people in Jason work on all the projects. Look, Jason and the, you know what, what projects Jason, which people work on, right? Look, Jason is the Jason division of the Institute of Defense. Yeah, and that means that everybody who works for it is bad, and nobody has a right to come into this building. Look, you people, right. you people tolerate it. Counterinsurgency work by Letterman. A little bit of this stuff How do you know time. what Leon did? He admitted it. And how about the other people? 
What's right. big? All right, the Jason division as a whole. You know, you got 35 guys. Look, we tolerate you, Ron. Look, you Despite this vote of confidence, Wallace and about 35 CESPA people locked themselves inside Pupine Hall, the birthplace of the atom bomb, until the building was entered by the majority coalition, a group he calls the Goon Squad. CESPA quickly huddled in a corner on the first floor. Pupin Hall was open. I'm the director of technical services, Department of Physics, Columbia University, the owner of this building, Pupin Hall. I'm responsible for the administration of this building. Your presence in this building is not authorized and I command you to leave immediately. If you fail to do so, you will be charged with criminal trespass and subject to arrest. Well, we have no intention of doing it. Put your sticks away, pick this gem up, and take him out to the way. Just a moment. Just a minute. Just a minute. Can you walk? Good. Oh. All right, you take this two sets caught down, and you take this. Two. After the goon squad, they were very anxious to get us out of Pupin any way they could. See, the, the goon squad was a political propaganda thing by them. And after that failed, they were left with egg on their face, and they just wanted us out. So they, um, you know, they let us know early on, on that morning that the, the, that the arrests were coming. And uh, those who didn't want to get arrested left, and three of us were going to stay in the building in spite of the police, and we were arrested. CESPA has continued demonstrating in front of Pupin on a weekly basis. Wallace and his two colleagues have been found guilty of criminal trespass and were given two day suspended sentences. They've also been ordered to appear before a university tribunal for disciplinary action. The form and time for the tribunal have not yet been established, but Wallace's National Science Foundation grant depends on the outcome. Okay, one uh, you have somebody riding in the back with them? Reporter Guy Sterling talked with Wallace. Do you feel that your experience with, at the strike this year at Columbia has changed you in any way? Are you more optimistic toward anti-war movements now? Let's put it this way. We have, as CESPA, a certain business to take care of. And we have a certain more or less successful style in taking care of that business. What we've seen at Columbia has uh, enable us to re refine our techniques, our tactics, and uh, uh, we're going to continue the way we've been doing on the basis of what we've learned. You know, it, it's been a su successful sprint. For those who tried to channel the demands of the strikers through the university's power structure, it was not a good spring. Four days after the demonstrations began, student Senator Jarvis Kellogg took part in an emergency Senate meeting called by President McGill. It was a closed meeting. Group of uh, some, 60, some 60 to 100 people outside, more downstairs. They inform us that unless they are admitted, they will break in. What is the disposition of the Senate with respect uh, to this matter? Proceed with the order of business, Mr. Kellogg. I'd like to suggest again that insofar as possible that these seats be filled up with the people who would like to come in. Kellogg, 22 years old, from Boston, a prep school background. In his third year at Columbia. Twice suspended, but then acquitted and reinstated for his involvement in what he calls workers' struggles a political science major, and probably the most radical student senator. A former member of SDS, he describes himself as a socialist with strong Marxist-Leninist ideas. 
Students waited impatiently outside the Senate meeting, debating whether to break into the meeting en masse or whether to send in a delegation. Sit down. The lady at the door said that the Senate just voted again to uh, not let anybody into the meeting. The Senate voted so to support so President McGill's handling of the strike, which already included a court injunction to keep the university open. None of the student senators voted for this resolution. While addressing the Senate, Kellogg received reports of activity outside the room. Thank you. I just received information um, um, from the editor of Spectator, who I assume was at the scene, and I, I won't verify one way or the other, but I will tell you where it came from, that there has been a bust over at the SIA building, uh, and that police have arrested a number of, a number of students, a number of demonstrators. As you look back now, do you feel that it was the best thing for you to have done to have left the meeting with the other student senators? I don't know if it was the best thing, but it certainly was the only thing. Uh, we had, I felt and still feel, been been betrayed in the sense that we had been told that the, there would be no police action of any kind taken while the Senate meeting was going on. That was the understanding with which we came to the meeting. In, in a sense, you know, our people were outside, and in a very real sense, we didn't even belong in here. But we came to the meeting with the understanding that that there may be something productive that would come out of this. Well, while we were here, the police attacked the picket line at SIA, and the editor, I had spectator, came in and Lowell, passed me a pad, and it said Nato, it had bust written all order. over it. And I went over and asked him <clears throat> to give me some details. When I got them, I felt that the Senate should know about them, and I think, I don't remember, but I think I asked the Senate to condemn that action, that what we felt was you know, a betrayal. And uh, one of the senators from the tenured faculty responded, uh, that's not on the agenda. And so it, there was no question in my mind. I just got, I, we didn't say, I didn't go over to some of the other senators and say, let's leave. I just got up and left because I was concerned about what was going on out there. I wanted to find out what was happening, and I wanted to let people know what had happened in here. But as I remember at the time, and I guess it depends on a person's definition of bust, you may have been under the opinion that there had been arrests, and yet there had not been. Knowing that now that there had been no arrests, would you have still done the same thing? I would still have uh, said, I was told there were arrests. Now, I prefaced my remarks with the understanding that the information I got was not confirmed. I mean, when I got up here, I, because McGill had made a very similar error earlier in announcing information that was untrue and had been attacked for it. So when I got up and spoke, I. I'm fairly, fairly certain, although it's, you know, I did it off the cuff, fairly certain I tried to make clear that the information I had was unconfirmed, but to the best of my knowledge, I knew that police had broken up the picket line, and, and that was the sense in which I used the word bust, and I also said that arrests may have taken place. I felt at that time arrests had taken place. I don't think it would have mattered. Kellogg and other student senators moved to SIA, where police had forcibly cleared demonstrators from entrances. The crowd then marched back to the Senate meeting. It was an angered crowd, one that wanted a direct confrontation with President McGill. The strikers' demands were an immediate end to the Indochina War, an end to alleged war research on campus, and the sale of university-owned stock in companies holding defense contracts or investing in countries like South Africa. The Senate was considering a one-day moratorium. Friday, April 21st, 1972, the day of the national moratorium. It resolved that the members of the University Senate express their sympathy for the gains of the National Moratorium and request the President of the University to use the statutory... No! 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 To implement this resolution in an appropriate manner. Read that last part. Coercion. Creeping fast. And request that the President of the University to use the statutory power to implement this resolution in an appropriate manner. I'd like to move this resolution. The Senate is held with, in, in such contempt around campus, and probably with pretty good reason, especially in the college. I mean, the contempt that the students feel for the Senate uh, verges on ridicule. 
And as a result of that, it's very hard to to use the Senate in that kind of way because people just don't pay any attention to it. How about the, the, the members of the, um, of the faculty and administration who are members of the Senate? How, how do they look upon the role of the student in the Senate? Well, I think that, that, that they're glad that students are here in the sense that they can say, look, students are here. But I don't think that they, uh, with a few exceptions, I would say there are some people, good people within the Senate, mostly younger, non-tenured faculty. Um, they don't really feel that, that it's within the student's prerogative to have any kind of say about what goes on here. The frustration and anger created by President McGill's decision to call police reignited smoldering student discontent. The following day, joined by sympathetic community groups, a thousand protesters demonstrated on campus before marching down Broadway to the Veterans Administration Building on 25th Street. As police watched, a smaller group staged a sit-in while 18 Vietnam veterans occupied one floor of the building. With coercive picket lines blocking entrances to six university buildings, President McGill set in motion legal procedures that would bring police on campus for the first time since the violent 1968 disorders. On Monday, April 24th, President McGill reaffirmed his stand that no police action would be taken until all other procedures were exhausted. But the same day, at university request, Supreme Court Justice Manuel Gomez ordered the strikers to appear at a show cause hearing the next day. The order had the effect of warning strikers that continued disruptions would result in arrests. In the meantime, Sheriff Joseph Brennan, a Columbia alumnus, served restraining orders to picketers for a second time. A day later, April 25th, the legal maneuvering ended and President McGill called police on campus. when the police did come here on campus and cleared the South Field, what were your feelings at that time? Did you feel that the president had made a mistake? And if you were in his position, what would you have done? Well, I'm not going to speculate on what I would have done if I were in his position because my uh, loyalties would be so uh, consistently altered in that situation that there's no use in trying to decide how I'd act. I was surprised. I felt that before the police were called on that, that the strike was in a weak position in the sense that it had uh, up to then or had started to to fade. Uh, people were uh, less attracted toward the, uh, if not the political issues, at least the tactical expression of those political issues. And that in that sense his, his action was indeed a mistake. I think that to bring police, you know, to bring campus, uh, I mean, uh, city police on this campus and imagine that you can control them uh, is insane. At one time afterwards, uh, someone was uh, quoted you as saying that five policemen could have done the job that 60 or 65 had done in clearing Hamilton Hall. Um, looking back, do you think that, that that's so? Well, I, I don't think that's what I said. I think what I said was that, was that the security guards could have cleared it. I, I, I don't say that because I wanted the building, uh, I wanted the picket line to be cleared. I say that just to emphasize the kind of uh, force that, that the university sees uh, or is willing to muster under these kind of circumstances, the kind of overreaction that it is willing to take uh, in order to ensure uh, its own prerogatives. I was just amazed that the police cleared Southfield. I mean, there was just no reason for that. And when they cleared it, that was when most of the arrests occurred. That, uh, that just stunned me. I, c I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that that kind of a tactical error had been made on the part of the administration and on the part of the city police. And the other thing, of course, was this tableau of, of McGill standing up uh, on the steps <laughs> behind, uh, behind the police, you know, looking uh, like uh, helpless in one, on the one hand, but uh, still as though he were directing the whole matter. And it was kind of a pathetic sight.
It's not the first time I've been first, involved in demonstrations, time. and the fact that somebody got hit or that I got hit uh, does not arouse indignation. It's expected. You understand it. Sometimes you're, you're surprised at the tactical ferocity, but it happens. I mean, these, the police are here because they, they have to protect the, the interests of the university, and the strike in many ways was attacking those interests. And uh, so I wasn't surprised when they went after us. I don't apologize for having uh, brought the police on campus. There was an extraordinarily difficult and dangerous situation. I was not somewhere else. I was there. I saw it. Uh, I was not injured, but I think that was a fortunate thing. Others were injured, and I'm deeply sorry about that. During the McGill News Conference, following the police confrontation, students decided on a new course of action, the occupation of buildings. While strikers sealed off Hamilton Hall, others burned a university-owned table in sympathy with the protest. At this point in history, Nixon, you know, mining Haiphong and bombing Hanoi into the Stone Age, that taking, a, taking Hamilton Hall would be a, uh, a pathetically insufficient response. Um, but as far as what went on before that, there, I think there probably was a time when when uh, taking uh, a building would have been defensible for some kind of limited occupation. I would say that the continued occupation of Hamilton was a mistake, and I argued against it um, because I felt that it was very hard to tell people who wanted to go into that building that being in that building was an, a, a direct act against the war. Now, in a very sophisticated analysis, I suppose that position could be defended. But I don't think that the people who were in the buildings um, went to the trouble. Or they, they probably went to the trouble. I, I wouldn't say that. I, I, would say, I don't think that they succeeded in, in communicating that analysis effectively to the rest of the campus. I think that there were real reasons why all the particular tactics were used at the particular times that they were um, used. I think it would have been much better if people that disagreed with those tactics rather than just dropping out and doing nothing uh, had organized other forms of activity, educational activity, to involve more people to explain to people why certain tactics were being used. But I think in retrospect that, um, that there were good reasons why all the tactics were used. Tactics are planned, disseminated, and implemented by leaders. Some people have said that, that the strike here in 1972 suffered from a lack of leadership, and they, they have also said that they felt that you could have provided the leadership at that time. In any way or at any time, did you ever um, see yourself as becoming the, the second Mark Rudd? Or, and if so, did uh, you shy away from that role? I if such a thing had occurred I would have shied away from it. I, I can't obviously can't speculate on whether that was happening to me or not. The reason that I would have shied away from it because I f it would be because I felt that one of the great strengths of, of what's happened here this spring has been a strong collective leadership and uh, that was why uh, people people who say that it, it suffered uh, from a lack of leadership they simply say that because they couldn't identify one or two personalities. Uh, people have a, a tendency to try and go after personalities and uh, the strike uh, this spring was was a very collective effort. Many many people were involved in in organizing and in uh, making uh, decisions and in talking to people and I think that was excellent. Leadership could have been provided by the University Senate. It was created after the 1968 strike specifically for that purpose. I think that the way the Senate is constituted now, in terms of representation, there are very few students on it. They get to talk. Uh, talk is very cheap at the university. In terms of decision-making power, with real power, the Senate doesn't have that power, and the power within the Senate is in the hands of the tenured faculty and the administration. The least they could have done is the same thing that they did in, in 1970 with coming out with a condemnation 
of the escalation of the war and making a, provisions for academic amnesty, which would have permitted large numbers of students to do a wide variety of, of anti-war and anti-imperialist activities. What it did was essentially followed the lead of McGill in trying to pretend that nothing was happening, that there was no crisis, that people weren't concerned. So I was very dissatisfied with what the Senate did. What was it that made you decide to run for the Senate here at Columbia University? Well, when I came back in the fall, uh, there was no ongoing political organization through which to work. Uh, I had quit SDS because of political disagreements, and they were basically, uh, they had no uh, real organization left here anyway, and was trying to think of, you know, some way, some organization or structure through which I could continue to raise the kinds of issues that I had in the past. And I decided the Senate would present one such opportunity and that it was, you know, acceptable, although I was not greatly enthusiastic about it. President McGill wanted change through Senate dialogue. Throughout the strike, he downplayed support of the coercive activities, denouncing the tactics as ineffective and undemocratic. The number of uh, people who were involved in the militant strike last week was about 150. The numbers gradually tapered off. Uh, 75 people who are determined to use force can hold this campus captive. We have what? seen that time and time again. Majority Coalition's Mike Marion attempted to break the hold at one point by ripping down a North Vietnamese flag flying in front of Lowe Library. Reporter Mike Monroe asked him why. This is the United States of America, not North Vietnam or South, or South Vietnamese National Liberation. Took it down because they're Nazis. That's why blocking the building. The same as the Hitler Youth. Who are you? Sir? I'm a student here. Yeah. What's your name? I'm not gonna give me my name. I would take it down with the same fervor that I would take down a flag that had the swastika on it because I, because in my mind they're both the same. Some students here at Columbia University have referred to the uh, CESPA as fascist and even Nazis. What is your opinion of this? <laughs> Ridiculous. The name calling here at Columbia during the 1972 strike was only a symptom of what seemed to be a deeper frustration about the aims and tactics of this kind of anti war activity. For the strikers and for observers, this frustration stems from unanswered questions related to the strike. Was it effective in shutting Columbia down? Buildings were closed. But by and large, classes continued to be held. Did the Columbia strike have any effect on the war in Southeast Asia? Or more directly, would there have been any Vietnam de-escalation at all if it weren't for this kind of anti-war protest? Even on a smaller scale, the strike's value is questionable. Did the protesters even accomplish local goals? The School of International Affairs here at Columbia is still open. Jason professors still teach at Pupine Hall. In fact, those who struck may soon see the school's administration crack down in response to the disruption of normal campus activities. There's also been continued dissension among the students at Columbia this year, as some strikers blockaded buildings, some of their peers cheered the police who tried to open them. In retrospect, the strikers acknowledged these questions as undermining the solidarity of the strike in 1972. But almost to a man, they contend that their solidarity against American involvement in Southeast Asia was not weakened by the uncertain effects of the strike. Nevertheless, each thought about the frustration and feeling of powerlessness he encountered during the strike of 72. One always feels a sense of powerlessness uh, when, when one has the feeling that one can affect things. I pretty much did not have that feeling because more people were moving on this campus this spring than had moved for two or three years. More people were doing things. It wasn't, it wasn't the same sort of massive all-inclusive response that took place in 70, but I think it was a response that reflected greater understanding. And I think, uh, in another way, in, in, in the effect I think that the strike here had internationally and nationally, I think um, it was quite far from power, 
powerlessness. It was it's much more a feeling of power and strength. In times like these, almost any action where you take personal risk in support of your beliefs has positive results. I don't think we doubted for a moment that we'd have an impact on Jason. We have had an impact on Jason. Any action you any take act. at this point is frustrating. because the, you, you, But simply because there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between your taking an action and the war ceasing does not mean that you should not take that action. The necessity for struggle still exists. You still have to react. You must react. Hey, hey, Bill McGill, how many kids do you have to kill? Hey, hey, Bill McGill.